Hey gang, Professor McElroy here. It's 6.30. I'm going to give about five minutes or so, three, four, five minutes or so, just to see uh, who's going to log in live on the Zoom, <clears throat> who's going to watch it recorded. So just give me a couple of more minutes uh, and we'll get started. All right, gang, Professor McElroy here. Welcome to the June section of Graphic Design 2. Uh, all of you should have had Graphic Design already. Uh, one, class number one, uh, which we covered a week of Photoshop, a week of Illustrator, and a week of, of InDesign, very entry level, kind of this is the software. Uh, and we had a final project at the end to kind of touch on each one of those skills. Graphic Design 2 is just going to give us an opportunity to practice each of those applications a little bit more in depth, uh, right? There's lots to these software applications. So we're kind of just spoon feeding the process here as we kind of go from what I would consider like introductory skills in Graphic Design 1, starting to push a little bit more of the intermediate skills uh, in Graphic Design 2 class. Uh, I noticed in the, in the uh, cohort for this class, even though it's a summer session, we have a nice little group of, uh, of design students in the course. And I noticed that at least one of you, I think maybe a couple of you were lucky enough to have advertising design class in between the offering of graphic design one and graphic design two. And so that's really awesome because you got to really explore the Photoshop program. And that's actually learning module one in graphic design two. So learning module one for this course will be uh, pushing the envelope a little bit further in Photoshop. Uh, week two, we'll kind of navigate through digital illustration a little bit more with drawing in Illustrator. And then week three will be all about the, uh, the container program of InDesign and kind of pushing our knowledge, our skill set in multi-page design a little bit further uh, in Adobe InDesign. And then we'll have a capstone course at the end of the month, uh, seeing what we've learned so far, kind of what we've learned more of as we kind of explore these software applications and start to develop some portfolio quality, some more advanced uh, finished design pieces as we continue to learn these Adobe CC applications. So you probably have opened up the course and taken a look at learning module one already. Uh, and we're gonna kind of do a couple of Photoshop skills here tonight as we get into 
uh, Photoshop a little bit further. It is rather warm in the lab here tonight. So I'm gonna try to keep my lecture to about an hour and a half, uh, kind of wrap up some basic Photoshop skills I want you guys to have as we kind of dive into our Photoshop book. So I'm just gonna to touch on a few things tonight in the coursework as we kind of start navigating into some uh, different, different uh, tools and skills in Photoshop. Uh, like I said, some of you had advertising design, so this should be a really easy week for you because we're going to do text, we're going to do some clipping paths, we're going to play in the pen tool a little bit, uh, and we're going to create kind of a, a finished advertisement. So, and uh, next week, then we'll do some advanced, kind of more advanced digital illustration drawing, and we'll talk a little bit more in vector graphic form, uh, how to create vector shapes. Uh, so tonight's all about Photoshop. So let's just jump real quick into the learning module because I want you guys to kind of take a look at the module, make sure you're comfortable. Everyone in the class, uh, this cohort this month has had Graph Design One, has had classes in Canvas before, I've had classes at Hodges before. So I'm not really worried about you creating artwork, submitting artwork or anything like that. So let's just make sure we go over some of those basic things again. If you had the opportunity, you probably clicked on the digital bookshelf and you noticed that we're using our Photoshop, Illustrator and InDesign book that we used in Graphic Design One. All we're gonna do is build on those skill sets and kind of push to some of the more advanced chapters. With that being said, you should already know how to go to peachpit.com slash register, register your book, download the student files uh, for each of our chapter assignments. We're doing seven, eight, and nine in your Photoshop book this week. So it's basic pen tool, text tool, and some advanced composing of images or image composition. Those are our three chapter assignments for this week. And then we have a small out of book project of creating a few, uh, what I call like uh, scary posters, uh, scary images uh, for our out of book project. So we'll cover text and pen tool and some basic image composition composing tonight as part of our lecture. Like I said, by eight o'clock, I'm hoping to have it wrapped up give you guys a chance to work in your book assignments, whatever you wanna do. Uh, this week should be kind of an easy week for you, kind of ease you into the process. So just know that we need the source files. You're gonna to need to download student files for your chapters, just like Graphic Design One. You're gonna to need to go into the assignment and then submit the PSD file or PDF file for me as you complete each of your three chapter assignments. When we're dealing in Photoshop, PDFs are really the best submissions because they're huge Photoshop files. It doesn't matter how simple the process was in the book. And there are some pretty simple projects in your book for the first couple of chapters, seven and eight for sure. Uh, PDFs, file save as Photoshop PDF will compress the image a little bit if you choose smallest file size, and that will make life a lot easier with submitting in Canvas, depending on what your internet speed is at the house. So just kind of keep that in mind that uh, compressing the image will help your submission. Be patient in the submission process because it does take a little time to upload at times. So just be aware of that. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and just close eCampus because I don't need the book right now. Uh, I'm gonna go back into our modules. So just remember that you're submitting chapter assignments for me. So remember, you gotta give me the PDF or PSD file of your chapter assignments, only six, seven, and eight. They're about 45 minutes each project. I'm not worried about that. That should be pretty easy for you. If you take your time, follow along, do the process. We already did the first five chapters in Graphic Design 1. So Graphic Design 2 shouldn't be a problem for you for following along in the book assignments. Just make sure you give me the completed file, PSD or Photoshop PDF as you submit. We already tackled that in Graphic Design 1. That's the beauty about Graphic Design 2. We've already done the process. You should not have a problem doing the process uh, in your out of book project. You could submit that as a PDF file as well. Just, get, just keep it easy, keep it simple, give it to me that way, and we will complete that. This is about 45 minutes, hour and a half, and about two and a half hours maybe for your three book projects to kind of kick off the class. The out of book project could take you four, five, six hours because we're creating a few posters. So just kind of keep that in mind to space it out and don't force everything in at the last minute. And don't try to let things snowball in graphic design too, because each week we're doing a different software application. So try to do your Photoshop work this week. 
Don't wait till next week when we're doing Illustrator, be doing Photoshop work. You wanna concentrate on the application we're using in class. Don't let it roll over because you're gonna forget stuff that you should have remembered last week, this week. So just keep that in mind. We need to make sure that we're working on our projects in the week that we're working on our projects uh, so that we can kind of keep the ball rolling. Okay, so we're gonna tackle in essence our three chapter assignment skills tonight in our lecture. So you just follow along. We're gonna download some images. We're gonna open up Adobe Photoshop and we're gonna play around with some pictures and things. So follow along with me if you want to. This is recorded. It's a live lecture, but it's also recorded in Zoom. I'm gonna post the lecture in the announcement section. You can follow along now. You can just listen to me now. You can watch it later in order to do whatever practice you wanna do, whatever works best for you. We're gonna to try to navigate from, through some of these basic skills. You already had graphics Design one, you already know basic Photoshop. I shouldn't have to go over the basic tools as we start to kind of push into some more intermediate skills. If you were lucky enough to have advertising design between graphic design one and graphic design two, then you should feel very comfortable with basic clipping mass, with text tool, with using the pen tool, some basic skills that we're working on. But this is a buildup from chapter from graphic design one. So hopefully no one in this cohort is in graphic design two that did not take graphic design one. You need to at least know some basic skills Every once in a while a student gets a waiver because they already know some basic Photoshop and they can navigate through graphic design two without not having graphic design one. But just keep in mind that practice makes not perfect, but better. So we got to practice, practice, practice. Hopefully you have access to Photoshop at home. If not, every lab, every computer, everything on Hodges has Photoshop from the library to 221 to any of the labs on campus. So if you need to come in and practice, you need to come and play around. You have access to the software anywhere on campus. It is nice to have it at home. You can use vec you can use vlab.hodges.edu, but that is a, a computer sitting on campus. It is slow if you have a slower internet connection. It is not ideal for using the software at home, but if you need to do it that way, that's okay. You can access it through vlab.hodges.edu uh, and you can access the software. You need to practice it. It does take practice. The pen tool is not easy. We're going to use the pen tool tonight. It's not overly intuitive and easy. It does take a little practice. I've been designing for almost 27 years. I still have to practice the pen tool, the pencil, the different tools. You need, it's kind of like riding a bike. You can get it at first, but you do need to keep riding the bike. So just be aware of that. When you don't do something for a while, you kind of lose it a little bit. You gain it back quickly, but you do lose it a little bit. So if you have a semester between graphic design one and graphic design two, stick with it, practice, do it. And that way you'll get a little more comfortable with it. I will talk about some of the tools as we navigate through tonight, but I'm gonna to try to highlight specifically things that are in chapter six seven and eight. That way, when you get to the chapters, you feel more comfortable. So it is 45 minutes each chapter. It doesn't take you two hours each chapter. But some students like to do the chapter a few times, kind of to reinforce the skills. So then it will take you a little bit longer to do it. I like to do the projects outside of the book with my own images because it's a little more fun. It's a little more inspiring. And that way we can kind of play around a little bit, but your book is really good with nice images. It's got good images. It's got good projects. It is uh, Adobe Press, which means it's certified by Adobe. So they do a good job with the images and the projects, but I still like to kind of create my own things at times. So uh, let's jump into Photoshop and let's play around with images a little bit. So I'm going to go out here and I'm going to open up a website just to grab some pictures that we can play around with. You can grab them with me. You can just watch. You can follow along, whatever you want to do in order to kind of absorb the process. So we're going to go out to pexels.com, P-E-X-E-L-S.com. It is a great website for free, very high quality images. And by high quality, I mean 20 inch by 30 inch high resolution images. Anything we download here, you could use professionally if you needed to in order to create a really high resolution, high quality composition. Uh, the pictures on here are really outstanding. So we're gonna go out and we're gonna download a few pictures, just something to play with. 
so that we can use the pen tool, we can use the text tool, we can cut out a few pictures, we can talk about the different processes for cutting out pictures in Photoshop to see what is most comfortable for you, what works the best for you. In the end, we want to take multiple images, combine them together in one file to make one composition solution. Okay, so let's get into pexels.com and we're gonna download a few pictures. Uh, my family vacation, we're going into the mountains. So let's go out and find a mountains picture. Uh, Pexels is awesome. If you have any projects outside of the book that you're looking for images to play around with for your solutions, this is a great website. I mean, there are some really high quality images. So we need some mountain pictures we're gonna get some mountains, we're gonna get a hiker, we're just gonna combine a few images so we can do the projects that we have in the book, kind of using outside images to reinforce those projects. Hopefully you've been touching Photoshop a little bit over the months, so nothing is like super new to you as you're kind of navigating through the process, but there are some beautiful pictures here. So we need, we need a mountain picture, we're gonna need a forest or some trees, so let's look at some different things. Now, you can download any pictures you want. You don't even have to download the same pictures as me. Uh, I like to go through the process of downloading them so it reinforces how you do it yourself. I could put a zip file in the announcement section with all the pictures already in it, but then you're not gonna remember how to get the pictures or use the pictures or anything else during the process. So sometimes I like to go and just download them. So I'm gonna find a picture here. This is a really nice picture. I'm gonna click on here. I'm gonna click on download. And you're gonna notice it's gonna download here. If you're on a PC, it's gonna download into your download folders. If you're lucky enough to have a Mac, which really is the coolest computers on the planet, ha ha ha, uh, it downloads it and puts it right over here in our little download area. So I'm gonna drag it over and drop it on the desktop. So now I have that picture, I'm gonna go ahead and close it. So you'll notice, I'm just gonna hit my space bar. Here's my image right here. We're gonna open it up in Photoshop and a a minute or two, but I'm gonna go in and download a few images so we have them all ready so that when we play with our pictures in Photoshop, we already have our pictures downloaded. So we need mountains, we need a forest of some kind. So let's do forest. So let's see if we can get a photo of a bunch of trees together, maybe from an aerial perspective. Here's a bunch of trees together from an aerial perspective. I'm gonna go ahead and download that image. So I'm gonna click on the little thing and it's gonna download it. You're gonna notice it's right over here. I'm gonna drag it to the desktop. So I have a mountain image and now I have some trees, just a forest, because we're gonna use a clipping mask technique to cut the trees out of the words, just so that we have the basics going on here. Okay, so I got my two pictures here so far, mountains and trees. <clears throat> And then we got to use the pen tool to cut out at least one image in Photoshop so we can kind of remember how that process works. I'll talk about a few different ways of cutting objects out in Photoshop just to kind of get you comfortable with different ways of doing it. Your book uses the pen tool to select some oranges and then cuts the oranges out of the basket of oranges it has. So it uses that process, but there are a few different processes. So let's do hiker. So let's see if we can find a hiker image. So I'm gonna scroll down here a little bit. Let's see what different pictures we have. There's a hiker there and there's a hiker. I'm just trying to see what we have. I'm gonna to try to find one where the person is least has a little separation from foreground to background because it does make it a little easier to cut the object out if there is some separation between the hiker and the background. So I'm just kind of looking here to see what we have. I mean, this is a really great resource for some really high quality images. So I'm just seeing what the options are here. Some are close up, some are a little bit further away. Some have a puppy in the backpack, some don't. This guy, this picture right here, he's pretty good. See how he's kind of silhouetted on the background. It'll make it a little bit easier for me to show you different ways of cutting a hiker or an object out of one image to another. So I'm gonna download this drag it over the desktop. And so I'm gonna go ahead and minimize pexels.com. Now that I have a few pictures, I'm gonna minimize canvas. Here are my images on the desktop, right? Mountains, forest, and hiker. I like to rename my images just so I know what they are. So I'm gonna do mountains and I'm gonna click on it. Remember, you can always right click on it and rename it. If you click on it twice and you just kind of stagger your click, you can also rename it that way. So we've got that and I'm gonna re-click 
we right click this and do hiker. Remember PCs and Macs are a little different, even though the software works exactly the same. Sometimes downloading images from websites and things like that are a little different depending on the operating system you're on. I'm a Mac guy since 93. I've been using an iMac or some version of a Mac. So do the math. That's a long time. I do work in a PC environment too, because I worked in corporate America for a number of years and they normally have PCs, not Macs, because they have a licensing agreement with PC companies for the entire company. Uh, but I also changed that culture a few places too and said, hey, the marketing department should have Macs, not PCs. So whatever works most comfortably for you is fine. Just know that when you download images on a PC, it goes to your download folder. You gotta be able to know where to find those things in order to open them up in Photoshop. Sounds kind of stupid, like, oh, it downloads it, I'll be able to find it. But sometimes it's hard to find it. So just make sure you're aware of where your pictures go. And please make sure that if you're using your own images, use high resolution images. Do not use low resolution images. We're trying to produce professional output finished products, which means they need to be good. So don't be going here to Google. Don't go in here to your new window, go to Google, type in hiker. Check your images tab. And then watch when I mouse over here, let's see how big some of these pictures are. Like if I click on this one, well, that was 1200 pixels. That's not terrible. Let's click on this one, 2400 pixels. That's much better. I mean, we're getting the higher quality. If this says 300 pixels wide, do not use that image. I'll say that every single week that we're in Photoshop and whatever class you're in, and someone will give me a three inch by two inch image in Photoshop that's completely low resolution, that doesn't look good at all. And I'll have to say, this is blurry. I'm taking points off. It isn't professional. Just be aware that if you're searching inside your Google window for images, you want large images. You want images that are enormous, right? At least 1200 pixels, but really you want like two or 3000 pixels wide when you're searching for images. That's why I show you pexels.com. The images are super huge. Wait till we open them up in Photoshop. You need high resolution. We're selecting pixels, little squares of color. You need lots of pixels to get good detailed selections. If the pixels are very low quality, the selection isn't good. The final product isn't good. The output of the images combined isn't good. They're not professional. And I'll say that because you can go in any local brochure, postcard, newspaper ad, web ad, web banner, and you're gonna see really poor quality images. Why are you seeing poor quality images? Because the person that created it isn't a designer. It's just some person, the company said, hey, can you put this together for me? And they do, and there's white pixels around the images and they aren't cut out well, and they're created in little box shapes because it's the easiest to make them in Word and stuff. So you can always tell someone who doesn't know Photoshop hasn't used it to a professional output. We're in graph design too. I expect a professional output. I do not want low resolution, kind of not well selected images combined together with weird borders, weird pixels, weird compression, blurry images, things that still have backgrounds in the pictures. So let's make sure as we're doing our chapter assignments this week and we're doing the outside book project, we're using high quality images. Can you go to pexels.com and download images that look like the book files, but aren't the actual book files and use them for your chapter assignments? Absolutely. If the book is using oranges and you go to pexels.com and type in the word oranges and download your own picture, I don't care. I'm not looking for an exact replica match of chapter six, seven, and eight, but I am looking for the skills to be reflective in a way that looks professional for chapters six, seven, and eight. We're in a Netflix world. Yes, I have two teenage boys and they're constantly streaming shows. One of my sons just started Stranger Things. And he's 16 and he watched the entire four seasons in like one day. It was like the most ridiculous thing, right? There's four, like eight episodes a season. Do the math. We're talking about like 30 episodes. He watched it in like a day and they're like 45 minutes each. I get it. You can binge. But if you binge and do everything in one day, it doesn't mean that you'll remember it day two, three, four, five, and six. So please try to space out your projects as you navigate through them, as you play around with them, so that you reinforce the skills and you learn them. 
This is four weeks of each program in a lot of cases where we're doing micro skills every single month. The beauty about Hodges is you're touching software every single month, but that also means you should be practicing every single month. If one month you don't have a design class, it would be beautiful if you did a little practicing in between coursework so that you continue to get comfortable with the software. It is like riding a bike. The more you practice it, the better you get. I am not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And every single week I learn a different skill, even in Photoshop, even though I've been using it almost 30 years. So just remember that there's lots of ways to do things. You need to get comfortable with the professional way to do it, but there are more than one ways professionally to do it as well. So practice, practice, practice what you get comfortable with so that you can do it well. Time is money. The longer it takes you to do something, the more it costs out of your pocket to do a project. So you want to practice it so you get good at it so you can do things a lot quicker. Boom, 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 right? Okay, good. That's the end of my pitch. So now we have three pictures downloaded. Hopefully you have three pictures of some kind downloaded. We're going to touch the very basic skills from chapters six, seven, and eight. So you feel comfortable when you need to do those. That will be your practice. And then that'll allow you to do your out of book project. Remember, PSD files or PDF files is what you're submitting for me. Don't give me an Illustrator file. Don't give me EPS files. Don't give me JPEGs. Don't give me TIFFs. Don't give me anything but a Photoshop file or a PDF when you're done with your assignments. Everyone had graphic design one. This should not be a problem. I'll say it over and over again, and someone will give me a low resolution JPEG. I do not want a low resolution JPEG. Please give me a PSD file or a PDF file as we finish our assignments. Okay, so let's go into Photoshop. Uh, we're going to create new right? Because we got to take a look at the tools a little bit in here, the basic things that we're doing, just so that we can reinforce the process from graphic design one to graphic design two. I will try to do some basic things, just things that we did in graphic design one, just to kind of build upon and reinforce what we're doing. But we are going to take a leap ahead to do some things that will require a little practice to get comfortable with, but you should get comfortable with. Okay, so we're just going to go to a letter piece of paper. Standard old like magazine size, uh, letter eight and a half by 11, 300 DPI or PPI, high resolution print output image. Remember, if you start with higher resolution and you need to make a web banner or something that's smaller resolution, you can always shrink down in Photoshop. You can't blow up. So if we start with a really low resolution image, we can't make it high quality. It's already low resolution. If we start with high quality, we can always make low resolution. So start big and shrink. Storage shouldn't be a problem anymore. You can get a terabyte thumb drive for like $9.99. So the idea is of saving a Photoshop to an external thumb drive and not having enough storage has really gone by the wayside. Start high quality. You can always scale down. The beauty about high quality is it tells you if you have an image that's high quality because it imports images into the file at finished output, which means if the image is really good, it's going to come in big. If the image is not so good, it's going to come in small. I always like to start with a canvas or an artboard, the document that I'm importing everything into. That way I know the finished format and I'll make sure that everything fits into the format. So we're going to go letter, eight and a half by 11, 300 DPI, portrait with a white background. Very simple document, right? Standard old document. Remember when you create in Photoshop, there's a background layer. It creates a background layer. Everything we import in, we're importing in on top of the background layer, right? This is our canvas or our artboard or whatever page, whatever document, whatever term you want to use. This is it right here. And remember, Photoshop is a layers environment. So everything we import in is only going to be affected on the layer we have selected. We should be at graphic design too, feeling a little more comfortable in our knowledge and understanding of Adobe and some of the basic tools or skills that we're using in Adobe. Okay, we have our artboard, we have it in portrait. The background is locked, which means everything we import in, we're gonna import in on top of this white layer. So I'm going to go in and open. I'm going to open up my mountains image, JPEG. Let's, so let's take a look at the image image size, right? Let's see how big this thing is. Look how big this thing is. 51 inches 
by 77 images at a low resolution. Well, why did they do a low resolution? They did a low resolution because they wanted to make it maximum width and height for web enabled application. That's why it's a JPEG or an RGB format. We're gonna uncheck sample, resample, and we're gonna change this to 300 resolution. So look at what happens when you change it from 72 to 300. It went from 50 inches wide to 12 inches wide. Is 12 inches still bigger than eight and a half by eight and a half inches? Yes. Is 18 inches bigger than 11 inches? Yes. Is this image going to do what's called a full bleed, which means cover the entire eight and a half by 11 document when we imported it? All the answers are yes. So I am resampling this image to show you that when I import it into my artboard, it's gonna come in the full size of the artboard. So the first thing I'm gonna do is click okay. Does it look like anything changed? No, right? Because all I did was sample the resolution and go down in the size, but it's still the 8.33% in zoom resolution. It's because I didn't change anything. If I would have resampled it, it would have stayed at 51 inches wide and went to 300 DPI, but it would have blurred the image because there wasn't enough pixel density to change it from 51 inches wide at 72 to 51 inches wide at 300. But by sampling it down, upping the resolution, but changing the size, this is what finished quality output is for print world. And look at it, it's good. This is a really good image. You need to remember this process because this process is important when creating a finished professional raster-based design. And so here's our image called mountains.jpg, and we need to bring it over to untitled document because that's where we're gonna compose everything. I like to do a couple of things when I'm prepping my files for importing them from one file to the other. The first thing I like to do is I like to right click on the background layer and release it from background. And I'm gonna name it mountains. And you'll notice the little lock symbol goes away. The reason that's important is because it's actually transparent behind it now. When I do unlock the image or the layer, I now have a transparent background, which means that it isn't white behind it, it's transparent. I like to do that before I copy it over from one image to another. So just a best practice, kind of simple thing to do, but it's good to kind of resample the high resolution, release the layer and rename it, and then let's import it into our final composition. So I'm gonna go in over here on the mountains layer and I'm gonna right click it and do duplicate layer. And I'm gonna duplicate the layer and I'm gonna choose my untitled document. So now when I click okay, and I go over to my untitled, you're gonna notice that look how big this image is. It takes up the entire document. I have my move tool selected, right? Here it is, I can move it around and it has smart guides. So it kind of snaps itself around the document. So I'm just gonna kind of drop it here in the middle, kind of right in the middle of the document. You'll notice if I click the eyeball at the mountains layer, that it is white behind it. It's white behind it because that was the original background layer. So best practice is to start with the finished output dimensions and resolution and import your objects or your layers into that document. That way I know the finished output of this thing is gonna be high resolution, full bleed and to the dimensions I need. So I've prepped this file pretty well. Do I need to keep my mountains.jpg now that I imported this layer? Well, you do from the standpoint of it's nice to have the source files. It's nice to have everything that was the original images that I started with when I made my composition. I'm gonna go ahead and close it. I'm gonna save the 300 resolution conversion. So I'm just gonna dump it out as the original JPEG to the desktop. I'm just dumping it over there just so that I have it stuck over on the desktop. So there it is over there. So now I have just my untitled document with my background layer and my mountains layer. Before I go any further, I'm gonna save this. So I'm gonna do a file save as 
I'm going to save to the computer. I'm going to save it as a PSD file, which is Photoshop document.psd. And I'm going to name it uh, lecture one underscore mountains, just so I have it saved in the file format. You'll notice that I have the layers checked, which is very important, which means I have two layers over here, background layer and mountain. If I uncheck uncheck this, it's going to flatten this Photoshop file. I do not want to flatten it. I want to keep the layers. The layers are the details. The layers are the pixels. The layers are the elements of each image that I'm going to combine. So your source file or your raw file for any Photoshop work should be .psd. That is the file format. If I'm submitting for my final submission, I'm done with my project and I need to give it to Professor McElroy, Photoshop PDF is the other option. Just know that when you choose Photoshop PDF, one of the options is to flatten the image. Well, that's good for me because it makes it easier for you to upload to Canvas. That's bad for you because it means the layers get all flattened into one layer. Make sure you always save your source file. If your InDesign is INDD, if it's uh, Illustrator, it's your AI file. Never get rid of your source file. You need the layers. All right, so we'll go ahead and click save. Click OK. And so now you'll notice on my desktop, I have the PSD file and I have my mountain image so far, right? I've got everything I need so far to import into my document to start playing around with things. Organization is really important, especially in Photoshop. Because everything comes in on its own layer, you need to be organized with how you do this thing. I start with the artboard, the bottom layer, and I stack layers on top of them. And I stack them in order from background to foreground. So obviously the white canvas is the background. Remember, there's a middle ground and a foreground. Traditionally, the foreground are text elements and the middle ground is our image composition, just to be kind of the organization of the process. The background is that full bleed image, the white artboard area. The middle ground is any additional images I'm gonna bring in, like the hiker or any kind of other images I wanna to blend together. And you probably can go on CNN right now, and I was on it earlier, and there was a cat laying inside big skyscraper buildings because they were talking about large cats in the city, and that was Photoshop. The buildings in the background was the background. The cat laying in the streets was the middle ground, and the building that showed the scale of the cat, which means it was in front of the cat and the paw was around it, was the foreground of the image. So you always want to build from background to middle ground, middle ground to foreground, which means even though we're using photos, you should be thinking about this as a process. So if you have to write it down on paper to organize your thoughts, you should be building background to foreground, not foreground to background. Do not type your words first and then start sticking images that you have to reorganize behind them. Can you drag layers from one position to another? Absolutely. So could you type the words first and then put all your images for your mountains and your hikers and stuff and then change the order of the layers? Absolutely. But it's like anything. If you're like laying a floor, you want to put the padding down before, before you put the floor down. If you're laying tile, you want to you want to put down the glue before you put the tile down. And then you do the grout, right? So this is no difference than any tactile process of building things. We're just doing it digitally. So think background to foreground. Okay, so we got the basics covered here. So now we're gonna start navigating into some skills that we need to know in order to do our chapter assignments. Your chapter assignments are all about blending images together, using the text tool, basic text tool, and adding some text elements to them and the pen tool for cutting things out. So for us, as a composition goes, we need to cut something out and put it on top of our mountain image just so that we can reinforce the process of selecting things. I'm actually gonna do it in a couple of different ways so that you can see the process of how you can cut out objects using different tools in Photoshop. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Ha ha, and I just used that term because I was talking about cats, right? There are best practices though. You wanna make sure you do it the best you can. There's more than one way to do it, but do it well. 
Don't do it poorly. And that does take a little practice. Some students love the pen tool and they use the pen tool in Illustrator, they use it in Photoshop, they use it in everything. Some students hate the pen tool and they're like, oh my God, if there's any other way I can do it, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna use the lasso tool, I'm gonna use the selection tool. I'm gonna use whatever I can do to select the object without using the pen tool. We're gonna to talk about the pen tool tonight because one of your chapter assignments is cut an object out with the pen tool. So we have to touch on it, but I'm actually gonna show you other ways to select objects too. So just kind of keep that in mind. I'm gonna to try to keep the lecture to an hour now, right? I'm gonna to try to get it wrapped up for you guys, the basic skills by like 8.15, 8.30. That'll give you a chance to do chapter assignments, take an exhale, whatever you wanna do. Uh, that and it's a little hot in the lab. So I'm gonna to try to keep the lecture to as compact as I can. Okay, all right. So next is we gotta open up our hiker because he's our middle ground. So here's our middle ground. I'm gonna grab the hiker. Here he is. I'm gonna do the same process. I wanna have all of the pixel detail of this image, including this really light blue sky, right? I'm just using command plus and zooming way in to show you the pixels, right? There are my pixel detail, my pixel density for my image. I know in my brain, I need to cut this hiker out and put him in front of the mountains. I know that in my brain. And I also know this is a blue sky, so it's gonna be pretty easy to cut this dude out. But I also wanna show you some best practices because not every e image is that easy. Sometimes you're combining images and it's not that easy. For me, I try to make it as easy as I can because time is money, but sometimes you just have to take your own pictures and sometimes it's busy and sometimes it's not exactly what you want. So you gotta kind of know the best practices. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna release the layer from background, just like I did to the other one. I'm gonna name it Hiker. And the reason I'm doing that is when I import it into my lecture file, the layer is gonna be called Hiker. The layer is not gonna be locked. There's gonna be transparency behind it. Everything is gonna be perfectly prepped for what I need. Then it comes down to how good I am at Photoshop. How well do I do cutting images out to combined images? Has Photoshop gotten easier? Absolutely. Does Photoshop basically find an object for you and cut it out if you have a good object? Absolutely. Have they made it where it used to take me 15 hours to cut a image of a model out of a photo to put it on a product and I needed the wavy hair to blend and blur in. And now there's feather tools and all kinds of things to make it really easy. Absolutely. But we still need to know the process because not everything is that easy. So we're gonna release it first, make sure we name the layer, right? I do wanna go into the image image size just to reinforce the fact that this thing is 42 inches by 56 inches at 72. So watch what happens when I reset it to the higher resolution. It is 10 by 13. Is this thing big enough to be a full bleed on my eight and a half by 11? Yeah. So even though it's a middle ground object and it doesn't need to be huge, I started with huge. Remember, I can always scale down. I can't scale up. I'm going to re repeat that a million times in the two years you're studying and the four years you're studying and the seven years you're studying. And still students will give low resolution, high low quality images. Remember, it's professional output. I'm trying to teach you best practices for professional output. Can you create a web banner using 72 DPI, three inch by four inch images and create something decent? Yes. Apple just had an event today where they showed the latest M2 Mac Airs and a little 13 inch MacBook Pro. The resolution on those things, the speed on those, the quality of those, the web-based images on those are unbelievable. They don't want three inch by four inch 72 DPI images. You wanna maximize the process. It's easiest to design in high resolution and scale down. Look at the size of this image, it's 35 megs. When I was studying in 1993 using a Mac G3 desktop with a thumb drive, uh, I would have had a heart attack over a 34.5 megabyte image. I mean, we were using jump drives, these little tiny hard canister storage devices. Now you have a terabyte thumb drive. I mean, it's ridiculous, terabyte thumb drive. You can put hundreds of images like this on your thumb drive. So not as big a deal to sweat resolution size as it used to be. So just keep that in mind. So we're gonna click okay. <laughs> Nothing changed, it's still 12.5%. It still looks great, right? All we did was resample it. If I took the 72 DPI 42 inch image and released it and copied it into my PSD file, it would have resampled it for me. 
everything that comes in gets resampled in the PSD file when you bring it in. I'm only doing this to show you that resolution matters and we're working in high resolution. So I'm gonna right click on this. <laughs> I'm gonna duplicate my layer. I'm gonna copy it over to my lecture. I'm gonna click okay. I'm gonna close this image because I have it here. Here it is. So now I'm just showing you my layers are stacking background. And when I hide the background, that checkerboard means transparent. In essence, still background, because I'm using mountains as my background image and my hiker, which is middle ground. So here he is. I'm actually gonna duplicate the hiker and make a couple of layers. The reason I'm gonna do that is gonna show you a couple of different ways to cut the hiker out. Your book shows pen tool, but I am gonna show you some different ways to do it, just so that you understand, get comfortable with different ways to cut out objects. Okay, so we have the hiker there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna right click on it and I'm gonna duplicate layer and I'm gonna name the new one hiker underscore select. And I'm gonna name the original one. I'm gonna name the original one hiker underscore pen, just so that you know it's the pen tool. I'm gonna to show you a couple of different ways to cut out the hiker. And I'm actually gonna duplicate the layer one more time. And I'm gonna name it hiker original, just so that you can see kind of when I'm working in Photoshop, and I'm doing a bunch of complex image blends and different things like that, I'll tend to save an original image. And I could even go in here and name mountains as mountains original. I'm actually not gonna manipulate that one too much. It's still just gonna be the background image, but I just want you to kind of see the process of how I do it, making sure that the image is high quality, the document is finished output. So if we do a postcard and it's four by six, your file new document should be four by six, 300 DPI, final finished output. Every image that I import in, every layer I create is in 300 DPI, final finished output. This is called a full bleed, which means the image goes all the way to the edge, right? Very simple concept, but you just gotta make sure you do it. If you start with an image four by six and 72 DPI, and you import in three layers, and then you decide, oh my goodness, it should have been high resolution. Let me go to image image size and change it to 300. You have completely train wrecked the file. You've taken a low resolution four by six image and resampled it to four by six, 300. Everything's gonna look like you licked your finger and smeared the image. The quality is gonna go right down the tubes. So if you ever in your design career have to create a print ad, a postcard, a magazine cover, a book cover, anything image blend based, start with finished final output, which means if it's an eight by 10 book cover, it needs to be at least eight by 10. Yes, we can now get into the fact that it should be 8.125 by 10.125 because there's a one eight inch trimming mark if you have a bleed on your image, but let's just start with the basics. It needs to be at least eight by 10, 300 DPI, import everything in. If you do the process of file, open a photo, you resample the photo, you change the file name, you release it from background and you duplicate it into your finished document and it comes in itty bitty immediately trash the layer and go find another image. You don't want itty bitty. I don't even think I want this hiker to be this big in my composition. I think I want to scale it down a little bit, but at least he's big to start with. If he's itty bitty to start with, I need to go find a new dude or a dudette. I need to find images that when I compose them together, they are high quality. We don't want itty bitty, we want big. Everything should start big. Pretty simple concept but a concept nonetheless. Okay, so now let's start by hiding select, hiding original and selecting the hiker pen. Now I'm not gonna do anything with the mountain layer, the mountain original layer, cause that's gonna be my background image. So best practice is to lock it, whatever layer you're done manipulating, lock it because look what happens. I can't move the mountain layer. I can only move the hiker layer with my move tool. Anytime you're done with a composition element, lock the layer. Because remember, if you select the layer, delete pixels, paint pixels, do anything to a layer, you've manipulated that layer. 
If I airbrush over the top of it, those pixels are gone. Hence the reason I saved a hiker original layer and I hid it. That way, if I ever make a boo-boo, I can always go back to the original. If you trash this layer and you don't have any other layers, the only option you have is to go file, go to file open, go back to open the original hiker image, re-unrelease it, resample it, reduplicate it, put it back into your PSD file and manipulate it again. So just start with best practice as we go so that we know that we're doing the best practice. Now, another best practice for me is that I like to zoom in. So I'm using command plus and I'm zooming in. I also like to use the space bar so that I can pan around my image, right? So by zooming in, I can always space bar pan. The reason I'm zooming in is because I need to see the pixels. So when I zoom in really close to this hiker's leg, see the shades of gray around the edge? This is called stepping or tiering of pixels going from dark to light. I need to see the edge of that because where it goes to white is important. I need to make sure when I'm selecting my object, I'm not selecting any of what looks like white. I need to be inside the dark shade of gray of the jeans. So it's really important to be able to zoom in when I'm selecting so that I know I'm selecting the right thing. Now, I need to get the mountain cliff, this little cliff here, and I need to get the hiker cut out. So we're gonna do a couple of different ways to do that. The first is the way your book does it, which is the pen tool. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to my pen tool. Here it is right here. Now, if you used Illustrator before, we practiced in pen tool a little bit. So everyone should kind of know anchors, kind of how the nodes, the blue nodes get clicked and pointed on. The idea of the Bezier curve, or when you click and hold your mouse and pull, it curves a little bit. I'm gonna use as many straight lines as I can for you in the selection process, just so that you see how the process works. So I'm gonna zoom in, I'm gonna hold the space bar down. Now I have my pen tool. I'm gonna to start right at the edge of the document. I'm gonna click my mouse and I'm gonna click along this cliff, right? Your pen tool is how you draw straight lines. So I'm not gonna to get too close. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit, use my space bar so you can see what's going on. So you can kind of see how I'm staying just inside the cliff, right? Just inside the cliff. So I'm not selecting any of the pixels of the gray of the mountainside. I'm using my space bar and I'm going around this image going around this image. I'm trying to stay away from any of the light pixels because I wanna make sure that this thing looks as clean as it can when I cut it out. So I'm gonna do straight lines with the cliff. I'm using the space bar to change to the hand and I'm just gonna click around this image. And I'm gonna use some curves as we get a little bit closer to the top when we get kind of where the guy is. I mean, if I was super kind of process on this, I might even zoom in a little closer to get all the little nuances of the crux of this thing, of this boulder, because it does dip in and out quite a bit. All right, so now you can see that I've gotten to the shoe of the hiker. I'm gonna take my mouse and click and drag. So you see when I click and hold my mouse down and drag, it gives me a curved line called a Bezier curve. I need to work my way around this shoe and kind of curve my selection of it. Now, you'll notice that as I curve, right, I'm gonna undo a couple, just so you can see, as I curve, the longer I pull the line out, the more it swoops, right? <laughs> the more it swoops. So when I click this, now I've gotta work my way around this shoe. So I'm gonna use my pen tool and I'm gonna work my way around the shoe. And so I'm gonna kind of click the pen tool, kind of work my way around the shoe a little bit. I'm gonna curve a little bit, curve some of it a little bit. And if I really take my time and work my way around this, I can get really close to the edge of these jeans. And this is how I used to do it. I used to do pen tool selections curve everything, get my thing going here and strategically work my way around. And you're gonna notice it's gonna take me a while to get around these jeans. 
get around the hike, or I'm going to leave some of the little strings that are hanging out there. Because honestly, when I scale this down, they're not really that important in the image. You're actually never going to see these little twigs, strings of his jeans. Looks like straps or whatever they are. You're not actually going to see them when I scale it down. So I'm going to kind of stay just inside the jean area here. Now I could what's called feather this image. So I could really kind of taper the edge of this image, blur the edge of the image so that you really get a clean cutout. And I might do that when, when I show you what we have going on here. So let's keep following along here. I'm using my space bar. You're gonna notice I'm using my space bar in order to keep this thing curving and going. And sometimes I've used a pen tool for a long time. So sometimes you'll notice I actually kind of curve this thing quite a big distance because I feel pretty comfortable on how the pen tool works for me just to buckle this jacket a little bit. Sometimes I free form it because I already know there are gonna be bubbles in and out and this thing's gonna bow and everything else. So I can give it some natural tendencies and curves to it because I know how it looks in the finished product, the end product doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but I wanna stay out of that light blue area of the image. I'm still following his jacket here because that will become a white halo in the image. And the last thing you want is a light halo in the image. So if I go halfway down the jacket, <laughs> backpack area here, pretty good beard, this hiker guy. I'm gonna curve it a little bit just to make sure I get his face pretty well. And so this is how your book does it. It shows you to use the pen tool. When I use the pen tool, I like to both save a selection and load a selection, which is what you'll see me do when I get to the end of this cutout. I'm doing actually a little quicker than I expected. He's got a lot of straight shapes and stuff that don't make it too difficult of a cutout. I'm gonna cut out the little notch in his hat just to make sure I have the pieces all together here. And I'm just working my way down. And if you practice in Photoshop, it makes life a lot easier when you get to Illustrator because a lot of vector art is driven by the pen tool. I mean, you really kind of have to know how to use the pen tool. So Photoshop is a great way to practice it. And because I'm zoomed in, I can really see the detail work of the backpack. So I'm gonna do the best I can to do a decent cutout of the backpack, keeping in mind that this is a middle ground element. I'm probably gonna scale the image down. So some of these really tight little nooks of tucking in and out don't matter because you're not gonna see them when I scale down the image to fit it in the cliff area I wanna use. And so knowing forms a little bit, like knowing what wrinkles and what bows and what bends allows you to really kind of pen tool this as a free form shape, not using the images like the Bible as like the exact thing you have to follow. I've been cutting out images for a long time. So I know where wrinkles are and bows are and bends are and things like that. So when you do know that, it does make, a like, make life a little bit easier and you can cover more of the shape in one swoop because I kind of know what things are gonna look like from a finished product standpoint. So let's just keep working our way down. And you'll notice I am very much avoiding the light background. I do not want the pixels of the white background in my selection. It will add a white outline. It will add a halo. It will not look professional always err on the side of just giving yourself a little wiggle room. Remember, this is a big image with lots of nooks and crannies. So from a lecture standpoint, I'm just kind of taking some straight lines, <coughs> practicing the pen tool a little bit with you, bending and bowing and shaping the line as I go white border, white outline, halo, bad. A little bit of an interior crop 
not a problem. Interior mask, not a problem. We're gonna be scaling down a little bit anyway. So not a problem to bow this thing a little bit, wiggle it a little bit at times. Your book has you selecting oranges. Not the most exciting thing in the world. At least a hiker has a little personality. So we can drag this thing and select and really swoop along the shape here. I'm just working my way around. It's taking me about 20 minutes or so just to kind of navigate my way around. Here's the bottom of my shoe. And then I got to finish my cliff selection because I want to cut the cliff out. So it's the hiker and the cliff. I'm just kind of following the rock formation. Straight lines are fine here because it is a rock edge, a rock cliff that I'm selecting. And I like to vary the shapes a little bit in and out and up and down just so that it does give it a rock formation feel. So you'll notice I'm dipping down and going back up a little bit. And now I'm gonna zoom out because you're gonna see that I basically have this guy selected. And I'm gonna kind of click around the edge here. And when I get all the way around to the original dot, so I'm gonna zoom in just so that you can see that it goes to the circle or the closed shape. So I'm gonna click and make this a closed shape, right? So there is my shape that I have cut out or outlined. And you'll notice it's selected as a path, not a shape. So this is a path, right? It's right here. All of my pixels, there they are. And I've closed the shape so it's all the way around. And you're gonna notice that I have my exclude overlapping shapes, kind of exclude the things on the edges connected here. So we'll go ahead and do that. And you'll notice that we have the option of making it a selection or making it a mask, making it a selection or making it a mask. If we make it a selection, you're going to notice that <laughs> it gives us the idea of giving a fuzzy edge around it. And that's what a feather radius is called. Feather radius means, do you want to make the edge of this thing fuzzy a little bit? So if we did a couple of pixels, there would be a blur around the edge of it. If we wanted a solid cutout, meaning hard edge, we would want the pixels to be zero in our feathered radius. So the pen tool let us cut this thing out. And now we have our feathered radius of zero and we click OK. And you're gonna notice we get all of these marching ants going around the image. All of these marching ants going around the image. Now, if we did that, we could do what is called save selection. So when I cut objects out, whether I'm using the pen tool or I'm using a lasso tool, when I make a selection out of this thing, I like to save the selection. And the reason I save the selection, and I'm gonna call it hiker outline, is that it'll actually allow me to later load that outline if I need to. If I need to load the selection, I can always load it later. I'm actually gonna undo this process because you're gonna notice one of the other options when you trace something in a pen tool is to do a mask. And you're gonna notice that the hiker has been cut out of the image and you can see that the image has been cut out. 
he has been cut out of there using the pen tool, right? So we cut this guy out using the pen tool. I'm gonna undo this for a minute. And I'm gonna hide this guy. So now we have him loaded, right? We cut him out using the shape tool. Here he is right here, right? He's been masked, he's been cut out. He's got a little silhouette shape around him. When I did the pen tool around the outline, if I would have done the pen tool on the inside of his legs before clicking the mask button, it would have cut this guy out with the interior of his legs cut out too. I just did his silhouette here. So you'll actually notice if I zoom in, there's actually a little bit of blue sky in between his arm and in between his body. If I would have used the pen tool and did those two shapes and the shape inside of his legs before I clicked the mask button in the pen tool. So, you know, I had the pen tool selected and I clicked this little mask button, right? It would have cut out that and this and this. Just remember that the silhouette is outlined first and then the shapes inside of the body that we wanted to cut out, we do second. But the beauty about the mask is, look at this. He is completely cut out, right? He is completely cut out, this guy. And you can actually see the blue outline of him. So look at this, zoom, 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 zoom. If I went into my mask, and just for the sake of the process, I'm gonna go in really quickly. And I'm actually gonna show you that I can go in now with my pen tool. After I cut him out and I can actually also remove the space between his legs. So if I didn't do it first, I can do it now. It's just trickier because you're gonna notice that as I cut, it hides the area of the jeans that I might've wanted to exclude. So I'm just gonna work my way around. Zoom, 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 space bar. And I'm just gonna keep going here. And zoom out. And now you can see it. Let's click on the pen tool, click on the hiker outline again, zoom back in. I clicked on the mask. That's what I did to give me the outline. So let me zoom out. Click on the icon for the mask. And so now let's use our pen tool and go into the jacket. And so I'm just removing the areas that I didn't get to when I did the silhouette first. And look how good it's now going in. So this is a this is a good practice. Like this is a good way to do it. Using the pen tool, creating shapes and with the shapes creating masks. That's all I'm doing. Go back to the move tool and deselect and look how beautiful he looks. He's really well done. And the idea with the mask is that I can always double click on the layer and create my layer effects 
and it doesn't affect the pixels that were in essence clipped out. So this guy now has a silhouette. So if I wanted to double click on here and add a drop shadow and crank down the size and crank down the distance. Crank down the opacity. Look at how beautifully he's cut out. And now he's in front of that mountain image. And remember, this is like high quality stuff here. I mean, this is final print output, really high quality stuff. This guy is not blurry. He's really well selected. So now we've been able to cut an image out using the pen tool and put him on the mountain. Pen tool is a really great way to do a clipping mask. Remember, it was a clipping mask. So when I had the pen tool created, the finished shape, I clicked the mask button and that's what created this little ghosted out or grayed area. You'll also notice that I can always load a selection with the mask. This is a really important thing because I can always save that selection and call it total hiker outline. And you'll notice I have now a total hiker outline saved in my layers. And that's a more advanced feature that we deal with as we move a little bit further along in Photoshop skills, but it's nice to have it cut out and saved. If I ever wanna load that selection, make a silhouette of it, do any kind of things, create a glow, a halo around this guy using color, I can do it. So like if I wanted to uh, add a new layer and I'm gonna load my selection, just to kind of show you how it works, uh, total hiker outline, and let's do, I'm gonna change the fill color just to show you, this is actually a Photoshop advertising design trick in your advertising class, but I could go in here and now I could fill this silhouette with the yellow. And so can you see it? No, it's hidden behind the hiker, right? The silhouette's behind the hiker. You can see him right there. But watch what happens if I do, uh, let's do, uh, what kind of technique do I want to do here? Uh, let's do, mm, let's do a, a mm, let's do, let's do like a distort. I'm actually just going to distort the hiker a little bit. And then I'm going to do a sil silo distort, what I call it. And I double click on here. And let's do like a outer glow. Let's multiply it. Make it a light yellow. Crank down the opacity. Watch what happens. Click OK. Let's do a blur. Let's, uh, let's blur more. Let's do like a motion blur. So using the pen tool to create a selection means you then have the ability to create like cinematic uh, glowing and halos and different things. And I'd even probably take this a step further and use my eraser tool and erase it from the legs and just have the arms and backpack glowing as if the sun is setting on it or sun is kind of gleaming on it. So you can see the technique, but the pen tool is a really great way to create shapes, to cut things out. And once you cut things out, you can make them selections and save those selections. So it's kind of 
an advanced way to do image composition, but it all starts with the shape creation with the pen tool. But let's go ahead and hide this because there are other ways to select the hiker. So here is the hiker, right? He's full, so it's the sky and everything, right? So you can't see the mountains or anything. And I have my basic rectangular marquee tool selected. Watch what happens when I click this little button up here. And let's click on this. Let's go into, I'm gonna crank down transparency a little bit just so that you can see where he is. So here he is right here, right? And you're gonna notice pixel size. So I'm gonna crank it up a little bit so you can see that I can actually go in and select this object using the basic selection technique. So see how I'm just using this with a brush size that's a decent size. And I change the opacity so I could see what I'm selecting. Look how I'm just clicking this and it's filling it in. Watch how smart it is if I start by doing that. It selected the entire hiker in one swoop. So this is the smart part about Photoshop. And look if I just start clicking around the mountain and adding the mountain to my selection. Photoshop has gotten very smart. And look at, it even selected between the arms. I mean, it's really smart, the object selection tool. But you'll notice, so let's see what happens here if I crank my opacity. So you see if I crank it all the way up, it'll actually show me what it included in the selection. So you can actually see the mountains behind it, see it? So it did all the arms and everything by just doing select subject and adding the mount. So now watch what happens. You see how I can choose feather here? I could add a little blur to the image if I wanted to. So watch if I crank it way up. You see how it's blurry right here? It's blurry right here because I put a 45 pixel edge. See how his face blends in a little bit? The image isn't firm. Watch what happens if I crank it back down. See how it's firm right here? Or subtract from the selection, make sure it doesn't get this sky. <coughs> Oh, took his nose off, can't do that. Zoom in. I'm gonna make the brush a little bit smaller. I'm just gonna click the edge of his nose and look at how smart this is. So now if I crank it up, it shows me what it would look like in full composition without having to use the pen tool. It's really smart. Object select or subject select in Photoshop has come a very long way. So now watch what happens. I click OK. Look at the difference with the grayed out pen tool mask and the black and white subject select mask. Does the exact same thing. They both look exactly the same. But subject select does a really good job. And I can feather it so I can blend in hair and everything else. Your book does the pen tool. And I want you to do the pen tool as the book project. Cut your oranges out. But just know there's more than one way to do a selection. Creating a pen tool shape. Using that shape. Saving the selection and masking the pen tool shape. So you have the ability to do like cinema quality, high-low, blending, halo, outer glow type of techniques. But the subject select works really good. If you have an image that has like a solid background like this, when this already looks kind of like a silhouette, the object select does, or subject select does a really good job. And it has the same ability to add a drop shadow, 
Look what happens if I wanted to add a stroke around the image. Let's say I wanted to really build the drama on this particular image. I could add a white, a black border around it and look how it cuts it out from the mountain very firm. If I make it only one pixel, it gives it a very slight detail. Like once you cut this object out, I mean, you have got full game into whatever you want to do. If I wanted to make the image smaller, look at this. It does it with the mask attached, with the object or selected attached. So if I needed him to be a little bit smaller, I can just scale him down and drop him into place, right? Very simple once you have the object cut out, very simple. And that's the process for cutting multiple images out. So if I had another hiker, I could do that. What if I went in here and I'm just gonna duplicate this layer and I'm gonna call him hiker copy and I'm gonna move him over here and I'm gonna do a uh, edit, transform, flip horizontally. And you'll notice now I have a copy of this guy and maybe I'd wanna make him smaller. Drop him in this corner, All right? Very simple once you have the object or the shape cut out, very simple. So that brings us to, so that was object cut out. So now we gotta talk a little bit like textual elements, right? We can collage images now, whether we do it with the subject select, whether we do it with the pen tool and we trace around our shape and then do our mask, whether we do it as a manually using maybe the magnetic lasso to trace around the object, which is probably one of the techniques I showed in the lecture in graphic design one. We're starting to get a little bit more advanced feature in the selection tool process. So let's use text. So now that we understand object cutout, we're gonna use text. So let's use our text tool and I'm gonna click on my text tool and I'm gonna type in the word hike, hike all uppercase. And I'm gonna highlight it because you're gonna notice it's huge. So there it is. I probably could make it a little bigger. So let's make it like 200. I'm gonna use my move tool. So there it is. And you'll notice that this is a text element, right? This is chapter six, I think in your book where you're doing base, basic text elements. Just know that when you're using text in Photoshop, you wanna make sure the words are big, that they aren't itty bitty text sizes like 6.7.8 point. Because when you zoom into a letter, it is not a firm edge. See how there's a light yellow next to the hard yellow? It has, in essence, a small halo around it. Not a big deal when the text is 200 point, a big deal when the text is less than 200 point. So I wanna put my forest trees inside of the word hike. I wanna put the forest trees inside of the word hike. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make the word hike as big as I can to kind of make it as if it was like a magazine cover, like a big thing at the top of the page. So I'm gonna scale it up. I'm gonna turn off my transform controls so that I can see my smart guides. These are called smart guides. So they're gonna snap it in the center for me. So I have my big hike word here, knowing that the hike word is in front of my silhouette. So watch what happens if I move the hike word down, right? It's in front of my silhouette. If I drag this layer down, I could put the hike word behind my silhouette, right? So if I wanted to make this a more of a background element, I could change the order of my stuff, my layers, and put this behind this image to give it more perspective, more depth, more of a focal point. But I'm gonna move it back to the top because I'm gonna make it my kind of like headline to the little design that I'm creating. So I'm gonna snack that in the center. So I need to open up my trees image so that I can put it inside of my letters. So let's go and open up my trees or forest image. 
And I'm gonna do the same process that I did for the hiker and for the mountains. The first thing I'm gonna do is right click my background layer and I'm gonna do, du uh, not duplicate. I'm gonna do layer from background. I'm gonna name it trees texture, just so I know that it's my trees texture. I'm gonna do image, image size. It is huge, 55 inches by 83 image inches. I'm going to change it to 300, which still makes it 13 by 20. Does it matter that to make it high quality as a textual element inside of my text? Absolutely. You want high quality across the board. If you're going for blurry, you can apply blurry later, but you want to start with high quality. So I'm going to click OK. I'm going to right click on my tree's texture, and I'm going to do duplicate layer. I'm going to duplicate it over to my lecture one and I'm going to click OK. And you're going to notice my trees are right here on top of my words. Now, I'm done with my hikers, so I want to make sure I lock those layers. So I'm going to lock the layers I'm done with. That way, the only thing I have access to is the trees and the hike. And I'm actually uh, I can wait to lock the hike, but I don't need that yet, right? So I have my trees on top of my text layer. Now, I'm going to right click on my text layer, and I'm going to create a clipping mask. And watch what happens. I'm going to create a clipping mask. And it's going to cut my trees out of my words hike. You're going to notice this little arrow in this indent. So if my images are on top of my text, elements, they will actually cut them out. Can I move the trees inside of the text image? Absolutely. So you can see I can move this around and find the very best version of the trees inside of the word hike. So there they are cut out. I also can double click on my word hike and I can add a drop shadow to the text. I could add an outer glow if I wanted to the text. So I'm just gonna put a slight drop shadow on it. And because I'm kind of making this my call to action or my headline, I'm gonna add a stroke to it too. So let's go in and add a stroke. I'm gonna make it black, but I'm gonna make it a little bit thicker. Watch what happens if I make it white. It looks beautiful as a white outline. So watch if I make it bigger. And watch if I change the position to inside. That looks really nice because it makes the inside stroke of the letters more defined or cut out. And watch what happens if I crank it up a little bit. I mean, I can really create some very, I can white it out. I mean, I could literally white the text out if I wanted. And then I can kind of crank this back and look how modern an interpretation it becomes when I narrow it in. Look at these shapes, the way they're rounded and they're kind of eating away at the image. You can create some very interesting techniques with layer styles once you understand the concept of cutting objects out and creating clipping masks with shapes. And so here we go, kind of cranking this up and cranking this down. I'm going to find the happy medium. I do think I want to make the drop shadow a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger a little bit darker, just so that you can really see the call to action. And watch what happens if I wanted to move this down, right? Let's say I wanted to move, let's move one of these hikers up. So I'm gonna move the hiker up. And you see how, let me, uh, let me go, I have him locked. Let me unlock him and let me lock these words. Look at the hiker, the way he can, that's just a refresh thing. Photoshop's getting a little hiccupy on me. This is a refresh here, but it's just RAM, it's just refreshing. We could cut the silhouette and move him right on top of the trees. I'm going to move him back down. So let's drag him back down. I'm going to stick him over there. All right, so let's 
So we have our elements all put together here. Let's add one more thing just so that we can go through that process again. Uh, we've had about an hour and a half lecture, but I wanna add one more object just so that we can see kind of how these things come together. Uh, there's lots of techniques in Photoshop too. Look at this selection right here. I could actually go in and let's do, uh, let's do, I'm just gonna kind of do some different things with this particular thing. So watch if I do perspective. I mean, I could make this look like he's standing on the edge of a pillar, like a little piece of rock that's sticking out. Once we have this object cut out, look at the way the perspective tool only changes the perspective of the image. I mean, it's really, really smart. I mean, we can do all kinds of things once we understand how to cut things out, right? You've got filters you can apply. We could render this thing with, uh, let's, let's do crystallized just so that you can see. We can actually paint this image. I'm gonna crank it way up so you can like really, really see it. But it's still cut out. It's just affected inside the clipping mask. I mean, there's so many different techniques you can do uh, once you cut the object out. But this is the in essence of your chapter six, seven, and eight. So we can close the forest. I don't need to save that. I'm gonna save this. I need one more object here. So I don't know, what about like a, uh, a fireball or something. Let's shoot something across the sky here that wouldn't be so appealing, but would be interestingly fun if we were creating a composition. I don't know, maybe fireball. Is fireball a thing in Pexels? Let's see what it has. I don't know, let's try meteor. Trying different things just so I can see what's going on. Although the meteors are cool, they're too small. So let's do rocket. See if we can shoot a rocket across the sky. Oh my gosh, look at that. That's really cool. That's a SpaceX launch. This is an interesting image, but it will be brutally difficult on a dark background to cut that object out. Let's do satellite. We might get a nice image for satellite. Let's grab this thing. I know I'm creating something kind of weird, but I just want to reinforce the process a little bit here. So I can close that. Let's open up. Open up our satellite image. Let's uh, let's release it from the background. Let's resample it. Three hundred. It's only seven inches, so it's going to be a little bit smaller. Let's uh, duplicate layer. Let's send this baby over to our composition. All right, so there it is. Now you'll notice when I imported it in, right? It wasn't the full size. So you see how this thing is, came in at 100% final output. It's not bigger than the image. It's only seven inches by five inches. Uh, let's go to our selection tool. So let's see how it does with the satellite. Let's do select and mask. Let's do select object. We'll see how well it does. Huh, it does do a pretty good job actually. So let's zoom in. Let's make sure it did a good job. The satellite is pretty well cut out. We got a little something going on here. So let's lower the transparency. Oh, it's that little arm right there. So let's zoom in and let's take our selection brush and let's make sure we grab this little arm right here.
So I should zoom in even more to make sure that I'm doing a decent job here. And I also should make the size smaller just to make sure that I'm truly getting the edge of this thing. This is a skinny arm and it does blend into the background pretty well. Oh, that's much better. So now let's subtract. You see this little blue sky? We gotta get rid of that. There's a little halo on the inside of this object. Let's zoom in. You see how I'm missing part of the arm here? So it does have its downfall a little bit subject select because you gotta be very detail oriented on making sure this image is fully selected. But it does a great job. You're seeing it now in true, true purpose. So we'll click okay. Let's, uh, let's scale this baby down. Let's rotate it a little bit. Our hiking advertisement just got a little hokier. Let's move it down. So there it is behind the text. I think I need to rotate it a little bit more. There we go. All right, let's save this. I'm not loving the thing I did to that poor guy. He got a little too pixelated and distorted when I was playing around with him, but that was just for technique for effect for you guys. So uh, we have our guy now. All right, so we're gonna save this. Now, this got you through text chapter six, some basic clipping masks in six, selecting using the pen tool, the technique of selecting and using the pen tool, cutting objects out, adding some basic effects and textures to them, creating a completed composition. Your book in chapter eight does a scary poster with like Frankenstein where you cut some different images out and compose them all together. But we kind of covered that in this lecture. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to just highlight is the saving process. So when you're done with your chapter assignments, we're at an hour and 40 minutes. I'm going to try to kind of keep this to an hour and 45, hour 50. Uh, you want to save this twice. You want to save it once for yourself, file save.psd. Now, when you submit it for me, you can do file save as, and you can save it as a Photoshop PDF. Now, you're going to notice, <laughs> watch when I do save as a Photoshop PDF. Everyone always has the question because when they do file save as, they don't see immediately PDF. They don't see immediately PDF. It's called a Photoshop PDF in Photoshop. Now, if you're giving me this file and you want to upload to Canvas and you want to compress it a little bit to make life a little bit easier for you, you can do Photoshop PDF and do file save. Now watch what happens. It gives you PDF compression options. When you're giving it to me in Canvas, it's fine to do smallest file size. It will compress the file down. And I'm actually gonna show you the difference in the file size after I compress this. Now, you'll also notice when you do smallest file size that you no longer save the layers. Preserve Photoshop editing capabilities. If you save it as a PDF, and choose smallest file size, this file will get compressed. See how this box is unchecked? That means the layers go bye-bye. Your only file you save should not be the PDF. You should have the PSD file and the PDF. You can give me the PDF, but you should always have the PSD file. Because what happens if you submit it? And I'm like, boy, I wish you would have made the outline on your text, maybe, slightly thinner. So if you did like five point, let's try two or three. I think it's a little too dominant. If you only save the PDF, you do not have Photoshop editing capabilities, which means the outline has flattened. You cannot change it. So if you want to make the adjustment, you have to go back and rebuild it. You need the PSD file, but watch what happens when I save this as a PSD file. It was 326 meg. It is now 24 meg. It has cut this thing in, let me do quick math, right? It has cut this thing in like, gosh, almost 20, 
one twentieth the size, right? It really cut this thing down like one sixteenth the size. That's a huge difference. But watch what happens when I close my file. I now have a PSD file. So let's get info. 240 meg. So let's get our PDF file and let's get the info for that. 285K. 285K, you could, you could upload from your phone out shopping on a Saturday afternoon into Canvas, no problem in five seconds, three seconds. You're not downloading this file from your phone to Canvas to submit out shopping in less than 45 minutes. <laughs> I mean, this is a huge file compared to this one. Just remember, you need to always save the source files. You should have the PSD file. And if you want to compress for submission, you can save a PDF, but look at the PDF in Photoshop. It's still pretty good. I mean, this is still a pretty good image, but notice it's flattened. I do not have the layers anymore. So if you wanted to go back and edit it later, editing would be a no-go if you save it as smallest file size. So just keep that in mind. PSD for your records, smallest file size for my submission. I also would always keep the original images in case you ever want to use them again for another project or add more of those images into the assignment you're currently building. So that brings us to Canvas and your learning module one. When you complete your follow along for chapter six, basic text, you want to submit either a PSD or a PDF to me. When you do chapter seven, basic pen tool, you want to give me the PSD or the PDF. When you're done chapter eight, the spooky Halloween Frankenstein image composition, you want to make sure you give me a PDF or a, PD, a PSD of that. If it was me, I would save PDFs of these three projects. It makes it way easier and upload those to Canvas. The beauty about PDF is it allows you to preview it on your upload in Canvas. So you can see what it looks like as you upload it. The PSD files are a little bit bigger. It doesn't preview it as well when you upload it in Canvas. So make life easy and upload PDFs of these three book assignments. You don't have to use the student files from the chapter. If it's spooky Halloween people for chapter eight, I'm okay if you go to Pexels and download some Halloween images. Just make sure you do the same techniques in order to kind of mimic or copy the project that's in the book. If you don't like oranges and you don't use the pen tool for oranges, but you really like lemons or limes, you can download an image of lemons and limes and do the same process for chapter seven. I just wanna make sure that you do a basic pen tool, you do an image composition and you use some text elements, which is chapter six, seven, and eight, because that brings us to our out of book, which is to create a, a series of a couple of scary posters that mimic the techniques that we did in chapters six, seven, and eight. And please share a design topic discussion post as you're doing your assignments. If you found some cool images or you found a cool video or you just thought something that was done well using Photoshop when you were researching some things to create your stuff, share it in your discussion board. It's easy points, it's student to student learning. The summertime always has a little bit lower class enrollment four or five students instead of 10 or 12 students inside of a design lab section. So I like students to learn to share. This career is a career where it's team oriented. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna be working on a project that at least involves a person for something. It might be a printer to print it. It might be a web designer that's getting your image to put on a website. So start sharing as classmates because soon in a career, you're gonna be sharing as a designer. 
It also gives us an opportunity to use terminology that we might not use otherwise. So it's a great way to practice just kind of using terms like, oh, check out how this image is blended together or feathered or this composition, how well it's put together. Gives us a chance to use terminology that we would use in the career field. Remember, next week we're doing Illustrator. So please try to do chapter six, seven, and eight and you're out of book sometime between now and next Monday so that when we do Illustrator, we can concentrate just on Illustrator. You're gonna notice that Learning Module 2 is not published. It's not published because I only want you to concentrate on Learning Module 1, which is Photoshop. If you're daring, you can take some of your own pictures for your out of book project. I've had students make themselves the scary person in the image. Just remember, make sure you got a phone or a camera that takes a decent picture. Don't take a really low resolution image and try to use it out of, as your out of book project because the quality is not gonna be there. It's not gonna be that good. And then you're gonna end up getting dinged on professional output because the quality image is really low resolution. And remember the final project is high resolution. So if you import a low resolution image in, it's gonna be really small. Don't try to scale it up. Don't stretch anything up in Photoshop. If you combine images in Photoshop, you should only be scaling down. Do not scale up. And you're like, oh, well, I only scaled it up a little bit. A little bit is a no-go. Try not to scale up anything. So if you have an image and it doesn't cut it, it's not good enough, it's not big enough, trash it and look for another image. I spent an hour and 45 minutes going through high resolution best practice. Please make sure that when you're working on your stuff, you're using high resolution best practice. Remember, if you have any questions during along the process that you're working, please email me, send me a PDF, send me something compressed so I can take a look at it. I'm happy to look at it and give you feedback prior to submission or after you submit, I always let you submit again. So just make sure you're reading the comments in the comment section of your submission in case you like to adjust something. Some students are like, well, I got an 88 on it. I don't really care. There's a bunch of projects in the class, so I'll just do better on the next one. Some students are like, I got an 88 and I want a 92, so I'm going to work on this project a little bit so I can make it a little bit better. You'll notice that the chapter assignments are each 100 point. So these three chapter assignments are 300 points. The out of book is 200 points. So concentrate on the out of book project. Some students blow through the chapter assignments and do great and they get to the out of book and they don't do the project well. Make sure you concentrate and do the project well so that everything is well done when you submit it. 200 points are a lot of points. So you can take a ding really quickly on that. So take your time, take it easy. Everyone's at least basics in Photoshop now. And I look forward to seeing your projects. I've done about an hour and 45 minute lecture. I wanna turn off zoom so that students that are watching it later can have time to work on it it's open lab time now for anyone outside or inside the lab and let's see how you do have a great week and i'll see the assignments as you submit them